The topic for today is the cell cycle and cell death. Chapter 18. When sperm meets egg, the cell becomes a zygote. All the cells are the same derived from the zygote for a while. The cell divides and divides and divides, and then the cells start differentiating, becoming new things. I'll talk about that later. What I'm going to talk about today is the cell division cycle. What controls entry into the cell cycle? What decisions are made to, to divide or not to divide? It's important to understand the cell cycle because disorders of the cell cycle can cause cancer. Cancer can be caused by too much cell birth or too little cell death. So most cancers actually have something wrong with entry into the cell cycle, that is too much cell birth, as well as something wrong with the mechanisms that cause programmed cell death or apoptosis. So I'm going to talk about both of those in this lecture. So the learning goals understand how signals lead to entry into the cell cycle. We've talked about kinases and phosphatases. Kinases play a key role here. Understand why cells undergo programmed cell death and how errors in the regulation of both of these lead to cancer. Specifically, the cell division cycle is governed by cyclin CDK proteins. And these regulate key checkpoints. So I'd like you to know about the cyclin CDK proteins. For cell death, DNA damage activates P53. I'd like you to understand that molecular mechanism. And I'd like you to understand the basic mechanisms of apoptosis, that is programmed cell death. BCL2 and BAX, the caspases, and the role of cytochrome C from mitochondria. So here's a picture of the cell division cycle. You can think of it as a cycle, so time runs in a circle on this diagram. G1 is the initial growth phase. That's interphase. This is all interphase, actually. M is mitosis. I'll talk more about that when I talk about mitosis than meiosis. That's where two cells split. And you've probably seen a lot about that. So along here, cells have to decide to enter the cell cycle. They have to decide to enter S phase. S is synthesis, that is DNA replication. Once you start your DNA to replicate, you really don't want to stop in the middle because you can't go backwards. You end up with, you know, incorrect number of chromosomes. In addition, nerve cells have this extra G0 phase. This means that they exit the cell cycle. And they really don't have any opportunity to make more of themselves. So that's G0, kind of stasis. So the cell cycle, here it is. It's an ordered progression of events governed at key checkpoints. Okay? The first one is the restriction point. That's the decision to enter the cell cycle or not. The second one is whether or not to undergo mitosis. The third one is the decision to separate the chromosomes from one another. All of them have to be lined up. 
That's called the metaphase to anaphase, metaphase to anaphase transition. We're going to talk about each of these molecular mechanisms that govern passage onto the next stage. You can think of it as a kind of dial on a washing machine or a dishwasher. You wouldn't want to enter the rinse phase before you get the soap out. Kind of like that. You wouldn't want to start your DNA for replicating until you're really ready to. And you wouldn't want to start separating chromosomes until you're sure that all of the DNA has been replicated. The key players are the cyclin CDK complexes. There's a kinase, the cyclin dependent kinase, CDK, and its obligatory subunit, cyclin. Cyclins are like the backpacks that power the worker bees, the CDKs. Cyclins are required for CDK kinase activity. Key point, the synthesis and degradation of cyclins is governed at key points in the cell cycle. So during mitosis, the M cyclin is made just at the onset of mitosis and then degraded at the end of mitosis. Similarly, the S phase cyclins, the cyclin is made here and degraded when its job is done. So the synthesis and degradation of cyclins is a key step to drive the cell cycle in one direction. Proteolysis is irreversible. In contrast to phosphorylation, you can put a kinase, a kinase can put the phosphate on and then a phosphatase can take it off. There is no question when you make this and then destroy it, that's a, that's a way of keeping it all going in one direction. So for example, let's look at the M cyclin. And these experiments were done in Mark Kirshner's lab by Andrew Murray. If you determine the amounts of cyclin, that is the concentration of cyclin, during the cell cycle phases, so time is marching linearly on the x-axis here, so here's mitosis, it's the M cyclin. The M cyclin rises and then goes down right at the end of mitosis and then starts to build up during interphase and then goes down again during mitosis. Notice that the activity, that's this green part, is sharply activated even though the concentration of cyclin builds up. So the activity of its kinase partner must be regulated by something else. That other thing is phosphorylation. Cyclin CDK activity is governed by phosphorylation. There are two sites. One is an activating phosphorylation site. The other is an inhibitory one. Activating and inhibitory. So one turns on the activity, and one turns it off. Here's the inhibitory phosphate, here's the activating phosphate. So when cyclins are first made, they can bind to the CDK, but it's not enough. Typically, for the M cyclin, both phosphorylation sites take place, both, pho both phosphorylation steps take place and you have an inhibitory and an activating phosphate, but you have to remove the inhibitory one to get to the active cyclin CDK complex. Two sites of phosphorylation. So there are different cyclins and CDKs that act at these different checkpoints. Cyclin D, CDK4, is the one that governs entry into S phase along with cyclin E, CDK2. Regulating replication is cyclin A, CDK2, and the M phase 
cyclin CK. Here's cyclin B, sometimes called CDC2 or CDK1. And here's a table that summarizes that. DEAB. So in addition to the controls of phosphorylation and degradation of cyclin, there are proteins that bind to and inhibit the cyclin CDK complexes. These are called cell division kinase inhibitors, or cyclin CDK kinase inhibitors. And they come in two basic flavors. One of them causes the dissociation of the cyclin CDK complex. The other one just binds to the complex and wraps around it and inhibits it. So these are governed by DNA damage and other things. And also, these guys are mutated in cancer. So here's a little diagram to help you understand the control of the cyclin CDK complexes. You must have synthesis of cyclin, point one, and it has to bind in order for it to be active. And you must have phosphorylation of this activating phosphorylation site. So two things are required for its activity. There are four things that turn it off. Four ways to deactivate this complex. One, you can destroy the cyclin by the proteasome. It gets ubiquitinated and sent to the proteasome. That's nice because it's irreversible. That means it goes in one direction. Second thing, you can dephosphorylate the phosphate. You can take off the activating phosphate. There's a phosphatase that does that. Third way, inhibitory sites can be phosphorylated. Okay, that deactivates the complex. Fourth way, the binding of a CKI, a cyclin CDK inhibitor protein. Four ways to deactivate the complex, two ways, two conditions must be met for it to be active. So cyclins are destroyed by ubiquitination and proteolysis. Most of the cyclins, that is D, E, and A, are ubiquitinated in response to phosphorylation. So the cyclins themselves get phosphorylated. That targets these little ubiquitin chains. That's what these little question mark guys are. To be added covalently modifying the cyclin, which then targets it to the proteasome. The proteasome is like the master cylinder. Anything that goes in gets destroyed. Stuff goes in, doesn't come out. In contrast, cyclin B is regulated differently. Cyclin B is regulated differently. That's the M cyclin. So here's mitosis expanded on our diagram. You have to have cyclin B activity in order to go through M phase. And you have to have it for this metaphase to anaphase transition. That is where the chromosomes are together and lined up, and then they pull apart. You have to have activity of cyclin B in order to do that. Here's how it works. Cyclin B, CDK1, is a, is a kinase. It activates gene transcription of part of a specific proteasome. That proteasome will destroy cyclin B as well as this particular inhibitory complex. So let me go through it with you. Chromosomes are held together, right? Metaphase, they're held together by these guys, cohesins. So there's two chromatids held together by cohesins. The cohesins are cleaved by a protease to allow the chromatids to be pulled apart. 
the protease that cleaves the cohesins is inhibited. It's inhibited by securing. What happens is that securin is targeted for degradation by this anaphase protein complex. So securin holds the holds this protease in check. Protease is called separase. When securin is cleaved, destroyed, then the protease can act and the chromosomes can separate. So the cyclin CDK complex activates this anaphase promoting complex. This is part of the ubiquitination machinery that activates proteolysis of certain classes of protein. Or one, one protein that's destroyed by this APC Hi. is the M cyclin itself. So the D box is a sequence on the end terminus of M cyclin, cyclin B, and on other proteins. It's not phosphorylated. This D box tells the proteasome that, hey, you should be destroyed by the APC. So it's a way of specifically regulating the proteolysis of proteins that have this box, the destruction box, that tells the proteasome that it should be destroyed. So things that are only useful in M phase are destroyed by the APC because they have this. So M cyclin is all degraded by the end of M phase. There's no M cyclin activity. Then you start the next phase. In this way, it ensures that the cell cycle goes in one direction. So that's the metaphase to anaphase Transition. Now I'm going to talk about P53 and DNA damage. So there's a DNA damage checkpoint here just before entry into S, and there's another one here actually after replication. P53 is called the guardian of the genome. It's mutated in about 50% of all cancers. It's a DNA binding protein. It actually causes transcription. And so uh, the mutations that cause cancer or are involved in cancer are in the DNA binding regions. What happens is if you have uh, damaged DNA, P53 will try to repair it. But if P53 is not there, you accumulate mutations. And that makes the cancer worse. And so all the things that we use to cure cancer, radiation, chemotherapy, you actually select against P53, and without P53, those things can still, those, those cells can still divide. So here's how P53 works. Let's say you're exposed to x-rays, and your DNA becomes damaged. Protein kinases are activate, that activated that phosphorylate P53. There's a protein called MDM2 that targets P53 for destruction by the proteasome. When P53 is phosphorylated, it doesn't bind to MDM2, and it's stable. Hey, it can go to the nucleus now, and it can cause transcription of, guess what, our old friend, P21, the CKI. Okay, it causes transcription of P21 which is a cell division kinase inhibitor protein, which puts the brakes on the cell cycle. Puts the brakes on the cell cycle. So P53 allows the cell to repair the DNA damage and stops the cell cycle until the damage is repaired. That's how it works. So here it is in words. P53 is normally short-lived. An inhibitory subunit targets it for destruction. DNA damage activates kinases that phosphorylate P53, stabilizing it. It now can become a transcription factor, and it can transcribe P21, the cell division kinase CDK cyclin inhibitor. 
So then, this stops the cell from continuing through the cell cycle. If things get really bad, P53 can also transcribe VAX, the pro-death protein. I'll come to that later. So here's about replication. You studied replication earlier in this class. I'm going to tell you about replication. Oh, yeah. Are you ready? Sure. So let's say you're going to go through S phase now. You've made the decision. I'll come back to how you make the decision to go through S phase. There is uh, the origin recognition complex that binds to the origins of replication on DNA. And there's a couple of proteins that are required for that. One of them is this guy, CDC6. So that assembles, that assembles the pre-replicative complex. And then the S-cyclin destroys biphosphorylation and ubiquitination and pro proteolysis, destroys the CDC6, allowing the rest of the replication machinery to be activated. This guy can't go now somewhere else and start replication on another chromosome, right? That's an important point. Replication, you want it to happen only one time in a cell. So this is only made before S, okay? Can't, it's destroyed once S starts, so you don't get multiple origins of replication. So in this way, it goes in one direction, it only goes one time. So uh, I had to switch rooms because another class came in the other room. So here it is in words. The S cyclin, that is the cyclin that regulates S phase, is synthesized the onset of S. And its cyclin A complex with, with uh, CDK2 causes the phosphorylation <coughs> and degradation of CDC6, which is that protein which is necessary for assembly of the pre-replicative complex. Okay? This protein needs to be present in order for the pre-replicative complex to form on the origins of replication on chromosomes. But this thing is destroyed when replication starts. So it can't go and start replication on a newly replicated chromosome. Destruction of the CDC6 protein ensures that replication can go exactly and only once. One time. Once. Okay, now, recap. Let's recap. Let's recap. We've talked about the onset of mitosis, that is the DNA damage checkpoint by P53, and the DNA damage checkpoint by P53 at the onset of S phase. So those are two DNA damage checkpoints governed by P53. We've talked about the metaphase to anaphase transition governed by cyclin B, the M cyclin, and CDK1. Next, let's talk about the restriction point. The restriction point is the decision to divide, to enter the cell cycle or not. This is a very important decision. Imagine you deciding to give birth. That's how important this decision is. To, to divide, divide or not to divide, divide. That, that is the question. question. The restriction point is governed by cyclin B, CK4 and 6, and cyclin E, CK2. Two kinases are required to make the decision. We've talked a lot about signaling. 
growth factors activate many pathways, for example, the MAP kinase pathway, which causes transcription of cyclin D in order for the cell to decide to grow, to divide, to enter the cell cycle. So that's the first step. G1 cyclin, cyclins D and E, are made in response to growth factor stimulation. That's the net result of all that signaling that I was talking about in the signaling topic. These phosphorylate retinoblastoma protein, RB for short, people with mutated retinoblastoma proteins, they get tumors in their retina. RB is a protein that binds to a transcription factor, keeps it in check, right? When RB is phosphorylated, this transcription factor, E2F, is released and it causes transcription. Guess what? Of more cyclins D and E. So it's a feed forward, feed forward. It's a feed forward loop. Here it is in a picture. Growth factors cause activation of a receptor. Here's a bunch of arrows. You know all about the arrows now. Causing transcription of cyclin D. And it has to have its activating phosphate and not the inhibitory fat phosphate. Activates the cyclin CDK complex, which phosphorylates RB. Okay, here is RB with its little phosphates on it. RB then releases E2F, that's this little green half moon guy, and then E2F can transcribe genes, genes that cause the cell to enter the cell cycle, including more cyclin D and cyclin E. Feed forward. So to remind you of the growth factor stimulation pathway, receptor tyrosine kinases, for example, when they bind their ligand, they dimerize and phosphorylate each other. And these phosphotyrosines serve as binding sites for these adapter proteins. One of them is a RAS guanine nucleotide exchange factor, activates RAS. RAS then activates RAF, MEC, and ERK, or the MAP kinase, 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 MAP kinase, and kinase, and MAP kinase. These these then phosphorylate transcription factors, and these transcription factors cause activation of the cell cycle. Okay, key point. Key point. Genes that are mutated to be hyperactive and cause cell division are called oncogenes. Oncogenes cause cancer. RAS is an oncogene. RAS, when mutated, becomes hyperactive, hyperactive, activates this signaling kinase cascade, and then that causes the cell to enter the cell division cycle. That's why it's an oncogene, causes cell division. An example of the opposite is a tumor suppressor. RB puts the brakes on the cell cycle normally, right? Because it binds to this transcription factor, which causes the cell cycle to go forward. RB, when lost, mutated, causes tumors, right? So it's the opposite of RAS. RAS, when hyperactive, causes tumors. RB, when lost, causes tumors. It's called this tumor suppressor because it's putting the brakes on the cell cycle. So for example, an RB that can't bind to E2F anymore, or if it's just not there, that would cause a cancer. So cancer is a result of many mutations. But there are three in common, or three types of mutations in common. One is this CKI, CKI, 
which I talked about before, puts the brakes on the cell cycle. That's a tumor suppressor. Another is RB, that's a tumor suppressor. And the third is something to do with cyclin D, anything that activates cyclin D transcription, okay? And that would be any signaling pathway that activates a transcription factor that transcribes cyclin D. So all of these take the cell into the cell division cycle when it really shouldn't. So for example, when you have this uh, P16, it normally puts the brakes on the cell cycle and keeps E2F in check. When P16 is lost, say here it is lost, then we have this active complex which can phosphorylate RB and then cause E2F to feed forward the cell cycle, transcribe more cyclin D, go past the restriction point. So then once the cell enters S, it's committed, right? It's made its decision. Okay. So that's cancer. Cancer is typically many mutations, okay? Five or six or more. Some of them activate <coughs> cell division. Some of them inactivate cell death, okay? Cell death, so P53 is one of those. That's a tumor suppressor. P53 can cause cell death. And you can have also a hyperactive cell death pathway, programmed cell death or apoptosis, and that can cause disorders of um, cell death, such as Alzheimer's disease. You get too many cells lost. Why do cells want to die? It's good to get rid of cells that have damaged DNA, or they're infected by viruses, or they're no longer needed during development. Or in your immune system, cells have an off switch. So you get an infection, a whole bunch of antibody producing cells are made, they clear the infection. It's time to get rid of those antibody producing cells because they're no longer needed. That's the fast ligand, that's the off switch. Apoptosis. Apoptosis is acceptable. It's an organized form of death. It's discovered by Kerr and Wiley in 1972. And it reminded them when they were looking at pictures of cells, because they break up. And it look, they, they looked like leaves falling off a tree. So it comes from Greek. Apoptosis. Programmed cell death. Apoptosis is a well-conserved pathway. All multicellular organisms, all multicellular organisms have this mechanism in one form or another. That is plants, nematodes, humans. It's important for development and for the immune system. So for example, tadpole tails disappear when the frog becomes an adult. All of those cells that form the tail die by apoptosis. During development, all mammals have webbed fingers at some point. And these cells that are glowing here are dying by apoptosis. So the webbing disappears. So it's an important mechanism or pruning cells that are not needed anymore. Apoptosis is distinct from necrosis. Necrosis is what happens when you pour salt on a slug, right? Necrosis is messy. The cell bursts. The organelles are released. There's inflammation. There's a scar tissue that forms. It's painful, right? Necrosis is messy. In contrast, apoptosis is quick and clean. The cells vanish without a trace and they shrink, and the cytoplasm condenses, and the DNA is broken up into bits, and in fact, the nucleus is condensed and forms these big globs, okay? Apoptotic bodies then form, the cell breaks apart, and the bits are phagocytosed by other cells or macrophages. 
So it's a programmed orderly event. Chromatin condenses, organelles fragment, the cell fragments, the DNA fragments. It's all very organized. So here is a picture of the cell breaking up and the bits being phagocytosed in an orderly, non-inflammatory way. Okay? Doesn't hurt. It's a good thing. Here's some data from my lab. Fleur Francois was studying apoptosis. Cells under the microscope form these little blebs, these membrane blebs. You can see them here. These are the green one. You can see these membrane blebs. You can run a gel that separates DNA fragments by size, and you can see what's called this internucleosomal DNA ladder. And all of these represent oligomers of about 180 base pairs. The nucleases that cleave DNA cleave it between nucleosomes. So these represent multiples of nucleosomes. And here's a picture of uh, the apoptotic bodies of the nucleus. This is a DNA stain, and so it's fluorescent. So normal cells that are just fine look like this. These are interphase cells. But cells that are undergoing apoptosis have this bright glob of DNA. There are signals that are put out during apoptosis on the cell surface. Phosphatidylserine, the lipid that's normally on the inner leaflet, is flipped. Okay? And that's an eat me signal, eat me, for other cells to come along and ingest the apoptotic bodies. Why do cells undergo apoptosis? They're told to, or they are not told to survive. For nerve cells, I'll come back to this later, the default pathway is death, and they have to be told to stay alive. There's a receptor-mediated signal that's used by the immune system and other cells. And DNA damage can cause apoptosis, too. I told you about P53. It's a transcription factor. It can transcribe this guy, Bax. Bax. Bax is death-promoting. You can't even express Bax in bacteria. Bax causes the formation of pores on membrane. It's a pro-death protein. It's got a partner that's pro-life, death-preventing, BCL2. These guys are related to one another, and in fact, they bind to each other. There's a kind of equilibrium. BCL2 keeps backs in check. Okay? So there's a kind of a duel going on between BCL2 and backs. And of course, these are families. It's one big family of protein that are grouped in two groups. There's the pro-death camp and the pro-life camp. Okay? Several members of each camp. What Bax does is release cytochrome C from mitochondria. And we've learned all about mitochondria, right? Mitochondria are useful for making ATP. ATP is good. But they're kind of a Pandora's box. If you rupture the outer membrane, which has porins, but only small things can get through the porins. If you rupture it to allow big things like cytochrome C, all hell breaks loose, just like Pandora's box. Okay? So Bax and BCL2 regulate the release of cytochrome C from mitochondria. Bax promotes the release of cytochrome C. It actually forms pores in the membrane. BCL2 prevents it from forming those pores. So that's why BCL2 is a pro-survival and Bax is a pro-death protein. Bax causes cytochrome C release. Cytochrome C then goes on to activate <coughs> these things called caspases, which I'll come back to in a second. So let me talk about P53 for a second. We've learned about P53. P53 activates transcription of Bax, as well as the CKI P21. So if the DNA damage is so extensive that the, that the DNA damage can't be repaired, the cell undergoes programmed cell death. 
how it decides whether to just stop and not go through the cell cycle and, and to go through death is not completely understood. So Bax stimulates the release of cytochrome C, which activates these proteases, caspases. And there's a cascade, kind of like the kinase cascade. There's a caspase cascade. Okay. They're inactive, normally. They're activated by cleavage. So one caspase can activate another caspase. That's how you get this caspase cascade. They're cleaved to form uh, the, the prodomain, the N-terminal prodomain, is cleaved. And they, there's two subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit. Enzymes that are activated by proteolysis are called zymogens. Caspases are zymogens. There are several classes of caspases, and they fall into two groups, the initiator caspases and effector caspases. So the initiator caspases are the ones that are activated by cytochrome C or by this receptor, which I'll tell you about in a minute. These then cleave a number of proteins as well as these effector caspases, which then go on to cleave a whole bunch more. So it's a self-amplifying signal. signal amplification. So here's a diagram for how the mitochondria release cytochrome C and activate caspases. There's a binding protein for cytochrome C, an adapter protein called APAF1. This guy finds cytochrome C and then nucleates assembly of a whole bunch of caspase 9. It's called the apoptosome or it's a big complex, an oligomer, at least eight. This activates caspase nine, which then goes and activates caspase three and other caspases. So the release of cytochrome C activates the caspases by nucleating their assembly through this adapter. That's mitochondria-mediated apoptosis. In cells of the immune system, the caspases can be activated directly by a receptor which clusters, and there's an adapter protein, kind of like APAP1, which activates caspase 8, okay, another initiator caspase. And then caspase 8 can go activate caspase 3 and the other effector caspases. So it's similar in that you have a clustering event which activates the initiator caspases and then these go and activate the mitochondrial one because some caspases are activated they turn around and then cause the release of cytochrome c from mitochondria so the receptor mediated apoptosis activates the mitochondria mediated So what do caspases cleave? They cleave DNA inhibitor proteins so that DNAs are activated, causes cleavage of the chromatin. DNA repair enzymes, obviously, because you don't want to repair in DNA while you're cutting it up. Nuclear lamins, so the nuclear structure breaks down. Cytoskeletal proteins, that's why you get those blebs. And also signaling proteins signaling proteins. CREB is one of them. ACT, AKT, protein kinase B. So back to cancer. Cancer is a result of many diseases. Cancer is a result of many mutations. It takes a couple to get things going. But to get a full-fledged tumor, you have to have, say, RAS, another one, MYC, a transcription factor, P53, and different tumors may have different sets of mutations. So cancer is really many diseases. There are many ways, many ways to lead to cancer. All of this is kept in check by the apoptosis mechanism, by immune surveillance normally. But part of the escape from that surveillance is part of the mutations that may occur. Okay, nerve cells. Why do we care about the life of 
and death of nerve cells. Neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, there's evidence that neurodegenerative diseases are caused by inappropriate activation of specific programmed cell death. And that has to do with some growth factors not being present, like nerve growth factor. Neural tumors, such as neuroblastoma, kill people, kill kids, childhood cancer, because programmed cell death is not activated. These cells spontaneously die normally, but in kids with this tumor, they form a tumor. It kills the kid instead. During development of the nervous system, more neurons are born than are needed, and there's a selection for those that bind to the right target. So they send out their long processes, and each process has to connect to its target. Okay? The target secretes growth factors, such as nerve growth factor, which binds to receptors and tells the cell, survive, you're okay, don't turn on programmed cell death. Nerve cells have a, a while to live before they don't see this signal, but if they don't see it for long enough, they're committed to die, they undergo programmed cell death by the mitochondria-mediated pathway. So this is a way of selecting appropriately connected nerve cells. We hypothesize that endosomes carrying activated receptors for the nerve growth factor family these are packaged into endosomes which are transported on microtubules. Here's a long cell back all the way from the axon branches to the cell body. These endosomes are carried back on microtubules all the way back and the receptors turn off programmed cell death by the MAP kinase pathway activation and other things. So there's a kind of a duel for life and death. Right? The correctly targeted cells, the cells that reach their target, they receive this life signal, neurotrophins. Neurotrophins bind to the receptor. The receptor is internalized into endosomes. The endosomes are carried back on microtubules by dynein back to the cell body where they turn off the default pathway program cell. Intracellular duels. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. Going to stop. The cell division cycle is even more well conserved. So this is part of what's going on? We got a class in here. Oh, you yeah. didn't know about. So they're coming in and about. Okay, I'm gonna stop. You studied replication earlier in the semester. Anybody know anything about replication? <laughs> what is this class? Congress. Congress. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little okay. different. It's a little different. <laughs> okay, I better stop.